Good morning, good morning, good morning. <laughs> good morning on West Campus as well. I am excited to share the word of the Lord with you all um, this morning. We're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, and there's this passage in the 19th chapter that's really been messing with me. And so I want to sit in this passage with you all for a few moments this morning and just share some of the thoughts that God has been bringing up for me in a way that might actually lead us to a greater level of surrender. One of your peers, a student, actually shared this passage with me. Um, and I haven't been able to shake it since I read it. So um, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship in community and to sit in your word. I pray that something is shared in these next few moments that will inspire us to follow you more closely and to walk in step with your plan for our lives. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, for you are my strength and you are my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. I know we often have the scripture passages on the screens for you all to read along, but I want to actually invite you, as Pastor Jason would say, to engage your auditory processing. Um, and I'm going to read the, the passage over you all, so just, just soak it up. Hear the word of the Lord. In Matthew 19, beginning at verse 23, then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle and for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded and said, then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, look, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man is seated on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. The word of the Lord is blessed. I was a little nervous about preaching um, from this passage because this is a pretty aggressive passage when you think about it. Especially if there is meant to be any present day application, this is a hard passage. Yet as I study scripture, particularly the gospels, I am repeatedly confronted with how often Jesus just says things that disrupts the status quo. He has this way of disturbing the equilibrium in a room or conversation in such a way that it leads individuals to profound thought. And this passage is no different. What is being discussed between Jesus and his disciples in the verses I just read to you are jarring to say the least. At face value, it would appear that Jesus and his disciples are talking about wealth and that he's talking about wealth in a way that the people of that time were not accustomed to. I mean, we're talking about the Jews who lived under the Mosaic Code by which God promised prosperity to those who obeyed him, which means in this context, 
Riches were an indication of God's blessings, which is why the disciples were greatly astounded, as the text says. They were so shocked by what Jesus was saying that they asked the question, who then can be saved? The assumption is, if you look like the hand of God is upon your life, then the hand of God must be upon your life. The assumption is if you have the appearance of having the favor of God upon your life, then the favor of God must be upon your life. If you fit the societal and cultural standards for what is considered the good life, then you must be in fellowship with God. And isn't it interesting that disciples thousands of years ago used a measurement of godliness that we still use today. Look at them, they are so happy every time I see them. Oh my God, they're always smiling when I ask them how they're doing, they say that they are blessed, they must have the favor of God on their lives. They're excelling in their classes. Look at the scores on the scoreboard from the game last night. They get all the girls, they get all the guys. Look at them, wow. The hand of God must be upon their lives. They have cougar bucks. <laughs> They're shopping in pause and go, what? The hand of God must be up on their lives. Their family is intact. They have healthy, functional relationships. She got a ring by spring. <laughs> the hand of God must be up on their lives. And we never say it out loud. We don't talk about this in our friend groups, but there is a whisper in your heart. And you question the favor of God on your life. You question the hand of God on your life. You question the plans and purposes of God for your life because your life does not look like their life. That has to be why I'm sad all the time. That has to be why I've, I haven't found my friend group yet. That has to be why my family is in turmoil because we always view ourselves from a deficit position. And we conclude that the hand of God must be upon their lives and not upon ours. And so Jesus interrupts the disciples' assumptions. These assumptions that were rooted in materialism, classism, egotism, and the old covenant. And he introduces an expression of the new covenant where we are not judged by what can be seen on the outside, but we are judged by the posture of our hearts. He challenges this notion that only good things happen to good people. He confronts selfish Christianity that says, if I'm happy, God loves me. And if I'm not, God has forsaken me. And he says, this faith, this faith that will get you admission into the kingdom of heaven is not a faith that is materialistic or egocentric. This faith is not about how much you have or how pleased you are with your life. This faith is not about your happiness. It's about your holiness. At face value, it would appear that Jesus and his disciples are talking about wealth. 
But when we peer beneath the surface, when we read between the lines, when we zoom out and consider the aerial view of this passage, we realize Jesus, Jesus is not talking about wealth at all. Jesus is not condemning wealth. Jesus is not creating a class divide as a determinant for who will go to heaven. I mean, he said himself, with mortals, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible, which suggests that if this is a conversation about salvation even, neither the wealthy or the poor can save themselves, for we are all saved by grace through faith and not by our works. And that is really good news. I am so glad about that because there is no ticket that I have to purchase to get into the kingdom. God isn't adding up the dollars in my account to determine if I'm worthy enough to be named among his children. He doesn't consider the superficial markers of significance that often shape our society and sadly this community. You know how we size people up to determine if they should be in our group or the other group? No. Jesus is not creating a divide, but masterfully, Jesus is inviting us, all of us, just as he did his disciples, to consider the cost of discipleship. Jesus is challenging our notion of the good life and suggesting that the good life isn't necessarily the God life. And if we want to inherit the promises of God in this life and in the life to come, we may have to release what seems good for the life God has for us. Some of you are having a hard time with this one. I was too. Some of you are particularly having a hard time with this one because you're thinking, good life? What good life? You look back on all of the negative experiences in your life and you determine that you don't have a good life to release. But when I talk about the good life, I'm talking about the things in our lives that give us a degree of comfort and cause us to feel like we have a degree of control. And if it isn't material, it's often relationships, attitudes, ways of thinking, feeling, and being in the world. And Jesus is saying, can you release what might seem good for the life God has for you. He's saying, can you release what might feel good for the life God has for you? Can you release what might look good for the life God has for you? We have these, these incredible moments at the altar. We have these incredible life-changing moments at the end of a worship service where we say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. We have these moments in our individual time with God, and we cry out to him and we say, Lord, your will be done in my life. We just sung it in worship. God, I want what you want for my life. Has anybody ever prayed that prayer? I have. We repeat the words that Jesus said to the Father in the garden, Father, not my will, but your will be done, and completely forget that Jesus spoke those words as he was getting ready to be offered up as a sacrifice. Jesus is not talking about wealth. He's talking about sacrifice. 
Jesus is not talking about socioeconomic determinants. He's talking about surrender. You know what surrender is, right? It's when we decide to give up our own will and subject our thoughts, ideas, and deeds to the will and teachings of God. Literally, it is not what I desire for my life any longer, but it is what God desires for my life. And hear me, this does not come without internal conflict. Because I think I have good desires for my life. I think I have good ideas for my life. I think I have good goals for my life. Many of you came here as freshmen or, or transfer students with an idea in mind of how your time here at APU would be. And the most devastating thing for a human to experience is to have an expectation for how life will turn out and to be confronted with a reality that does not line up with that expectation. But surrender says, yes, I have goals. Yes, I have desires, ideas, plans, and even expectations, and I'm willing to lay it all aside for what you, God, have for my life. Peter responds to Jesus, and he says, look, we've given up everything. We've walked away from homes and families and businesses and communities and followed you. What then do we have? After we've given up all, after we've given up our will for your will, what do we have? After we have crucified our flesh, after we have picked up our cross and followed you, what do we have? After we have endured hardship as a good soldier, what do we have? After we have committed to you without knowing where you are going or why you're taking this route to get there, what do we have? I love this part of the passage because when I look at the lives of the disciples and consider how they committed to Jesus, they've always seemed superhuman. Jesus said, come, and they went. Many of them without even a question. But here, Peter is acknowledging, perhaps for the first time, the cost of his discipleship to Jesus. And after having walked away from everything, he's left with the question, what do I have? Possessing, having is an expression of existence. It is an expression of our humanness. And Peter is questioning, what do I have? How can you surrender to such a degree that you are left to question what you have left? Peter is asking this question after he had given up everything. Peter is asking this question after he had surrendered, but for many of us, we're not saying, Lord, I have given up everything, or Lord, I have surrendered. We're saying, Lord, if I give up everything, what will I have? We're saying, Lord, if I surrender, what will I have? In other words, many of us need reassurance before we walk away from the thing that God is calling us away from. And if that's you, I'm right there with you. 
And it's okay, because maybe we haven't reached the level of reckless faith like Peter. Perhaps we're engaging with God at the level of cautious faith, because we stepped out on faith before and our faith was disappointed. We're saying, Lord, I believe, but I need a bit of reassurance before I take the next step. And here's the climax of the passage. Whether you're Peter and living in reckless faith or me and living in cautious faith, Jesus responds to Peter's question. He doesn't respond with frustration. He doesn't respond with irritation. Jesus does not rebuke Peter. He does not say, why do you want to know what's in it for you, Peter? You're so selfish. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus says, okay, I'll tell you what's in it for you. I kept wondering why. Jesus just answered Peter's question. In other instances in the gospel, when the disciples had questions for Jesus, he he often made a comment about their faith. O ye of little faith, where is your faith? Do you not have faith? Yet here, Jesus does not make a comment about Peter's faith. He simply answers his question. And as I was considering why, in this instance, Jesus just answered the question. I was reminded of one of my favorite verses. It's in the book of Psalms. And here's what it says. As a father has compassion for his children. So the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we are made and he remembers that we are dust. (sighs) Jesus doesn't get upset when we ask questions in this manner because he understands the human desire to hold on to something. He understands just how difficult it is for us to surrender. He understands how difficult it is for us to have an idea of how you would like your life to turn out. And rather than pursuing your plan for your life, you receive the plan that God has for your life. Jesus answers the question. He proceeds to tell Peter about the eternal reward that is stored up for him and all the disciples. But he doesn't leave it there. He takes it a step further. And he says, if you have given up anything in this life for my sake, I'll give it back to you a hundredfold. If you've had to separate from relationships, Jesus says, I'll give you spiritual mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters. He says, I'll give you houses and fields a hundredfold. What this tells me is that God is not against the things he's calling us to release to him. He's not out to just take from us, but rather he's concerned about our relationship to the things he's calling us to release. And if there is anything in our lives that hinder our ability to follow Jesus well, he says, will you give it to me? If there's anything in our lives that might cause a stumbling block in our devotion to Christ, he says, can I have that? just for a little bit until we can change the orientation of your heart toward that thing. Do you remember that that gif or gift, whatever it's called, (laughs) that was circulating a few years back, that little girl with the teddy bear in her hand and Jesus is trying to get her to give it to him 
and she's struggling, trying to hold on to this little bitty teddy bear because she cannot see that what God has in his hands is far greater than what she has in hers. You see, surrender, surrender isn't about giving up everything for nothing. It's an exchange of what's in your hand for what's in God's hand. And you just have to have enough faith, whether it's reckless or cautious. You just gotta have enough faith to believe that what's in God's hand is far greater than what is in your hand, even if you can't see it. I wanna read an excerpt from this book I read several years ago called Costly Discipleship, and then I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna be gone. Um, but this book wrecked my life, literally. It just messed me up. Here's what Bonhoeffer said about this idea of costly discipleship. He says, it is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, above all, above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. Ye were bought with a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for these moments of considering scripture and for the personal, individual messages you spoke to each of us regarding our own lives and our own relationship with you. I pray that you would inspire us to have courageous faith, that we might choose to release what's in our hands even when we can't see what's in yours because we believe your desire for our lives far outweigh our desires for ourselves, although costly. May we remain in step with your spirit as you lead us into closer and deeper fellowship with Jesus. Amen. You all are dismissed.